are. My name is Charles Stang. I am the director here at the center, and it's a, a, a pleasure to welcome you to this event, this intimate evening with our, our two authors. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank the center staff for making this event possible. I'd also like to thank the Center for Middle Eastern Studies for co-sponsoring the event. Uh, before we begin, may I just ask that you please silence your phone so we don't have, um, and I'll do the same to make sure we don't have uh, uninvited ringtones, although it's always interesting to hear what people choose as their ringtone. I think it really says something about you. Um, so uh, you really might want to silence it now. Um, it's a particular pleasure for me to welcome um, uh, two very close friends of mine to the center, Marav Mack and Benjamin Balin, um, to speak about their new book from Yale University Press uh, entitled Jerusalem City of the Book. I've known these two since 2011 um, when my family and I spent a sabbatical year in Jerusalem and fell in, fell in with a, a really wonderful and diverse crowd of writers, scholars, and activists, of which these two were members. Uh, we felt privileged to be welcomed into that scene. It felt like a little bit of a scene there for a while. Um, so first, let me introduce Marav. And we're casual here, so I'll be using first names. Uh, Marav Mack received her PhD in medieval history from the University of Cambridge, England. Uh, she's a research fellow at the Truman Institute for Peace at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and is currently living in France. In addition to her work on Jerusalem's libraries and archives, uh, she's known for her research um, on contemporary Christian communities in the Middle East which uh, she's conduct research she's conducted in Israel, Palestine, and Jordan. Now for Ben. Uh, ben might be familiar to some of you. If you attended last year's List lecture, it was Ben who interviewed Andre Asiman on the theme of, quote, exile and elsewhere. Um, and we just learned that uh, Andre Asiman's latest novel, uh, a sequel to Call Me By Your Name, has been released, so if you're interested in that. Um, I, I, I haven't had a chance to see it yet, but it is apparently out. In any case, Benjamin Balin is a writer who lives in Jerusalem, and he is the author of, most recently, Kafka's Last Trial, The Case of a Literary Forgery. I'm sorry, Literary Legacy, forgive me. <laughs> Slight. <laughs> Whoops. Um, yeah. He's also the, common, uh, the, the author of uh, Running Commentary, the contentious magazine that transformed the Jewish left into the neoconservative right. That's a book that won him a lot of friends um, among the neoconservative right. Uh, that came out in 2010. Uh, Kafka's Last Trial was just last year in 2018. And of course, his, really his most recent book, of course, is the book he has co-authored with Marav, uh, Jerusalem City of the Book. Uh, Ben's essays uh, appear regularly in the Wall Street Journal, Haaretz, and Die Zeit. And his translations from the Hebrew have appeared in The New Yorker and The Atlantic. So in this new book, um, Marav and Ben have asked us what it might look like to see Jerusalem with its cross-hatched encounters between people of diverse faiths and cultures as a city of the book? Is it possible to use libraries and texts to catch the city's tragedy and its magnificence, to tell the story of a place where some of the world's most far-reaching ideas were put into words? Marav and Ben will share their forays into the city's most inaccessible reaches in the making of this remarkable book, which Moshe Halbertal has called one of the most intimate and beautiful portraits ever written of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the city that you call in your preface, this metropolis of monotheisms, which was one of my favorite phrases. So please, please join me in welcoming both Marav and Ben to the CSWR. So despite what you may read on the screen here, we're gonna call our talk tonight, blocking the food. <laughs> 
rare fact that we're actually in the same city at the same time to uh, do a sort of tag team conversation, uh, which uh, sort of will give a taste of our forays into the city and into sort of how Jerusalem has acted as a kind of center of gravity that uh, as I was saying, not just as a, as a place, a center of gravity that attracts um, exiles, but also in, um, a, a place that acts as a center of gravity for material culture, that attracts textual culture. And really this is an essay into a new way of reading a city, of, of rendering a city legible, which is to say not to look at Jerusalem in the usual way as a series of archeological layers or in a chronological way of uh, a series of conquests. Many of you may have read uh, Montefiore's biography of Jerusalem, but to really try to do something new, I think, which is to write a textual history of the layers of Jerusalem with an emphasis on how the diverse communities of Jerusalem have used their libraries, texts, and archives as anchors uh, in the city. Um, not just as anchors, but also uh, <coughs> as, um, as a way of getting at the plurality, not just of the existing cultures of Jerusalem, but the duality of Jerusalem as a place both real and imagined. Um, after all, in Hebrew, the very name of Jerusalem inscribes duality. Yerushalayim is a plural noun. It's a dual noun. The plurality is inscribed in the very name. That's a plurality not just of, of communities, but of, um, uh, of a city both real and imagined. And we look at sort of the libraries and archives of Jerusalem, many of them completely inaccessible, um, as a way to uh, bridge this distance between what we actually see and what we want to see. Uh, so, so, so when we approached um, our question and um, approached Jerusalem, this was um, very much, um, we were very conscious that we were going to try and do something that was really different um, than the way most people write about the city. Um, I had the, um, the great privilege to, to visit, to get to know places in Jerusalem that few people were able to access. And when Ben and I first met, I remember our conversations about it, you know, all those amazing parts of the city that people rarely even know about. And he kept saying, you know, we should really write this story and um, have the opportunity to to tell, to, to turn it into something uh, bigger. So this project really started as a, it started as a survey. I thought we need to know what exists in Jerusalem. It's a very old city with very rich um, literature um, that is not accessible to people. Let's find out what exists in, in the libraries of Jerusalem, see if we need to uh, preserve it, to digitize it, um, learn everything we can do about it. So I thought, yeah, it's something I can probably do with a small team of people within three to six months. So um, 10 years later, <laughs> or 15 years later, um, it turned out to be um, much, much, much harder than, um, than I expected or anyone else. And the first question was why, but why is it so difficult? Why is it impossible to visit those libraries? And what's the meaning of a library if you can't enter it? <laughs> you know, having all those books and if nobody can use them, what are they for? So I think at some point we realized that um, those libraries are actually telling the, the, the story of the psychology of a city. And perhaps this is what we're going to try and do today. So why are all those places closed? There are different answers to this. And I think we would, we would try to take you into the various places and give a few different answers um, to this question. So our first example uh, comes from the Armenian community of Jerusalem. Um, 
This is a portrait. So this this book is actually a collaboration of three people: the lead author Merav, uh, me. I'm responsible mostly for the errors, and um, we have a wonderful photographer, Frederic Brenner. Uh, and this is Frederic's photograph of the current Armenian patriarch of Jerusalem, Manugian. Uh, this happens to be on a on a day once a year when they bring out the relics from the treasury and process around the Armenian uh, uh, Church of St. James. Um, and perhaps I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you introduce the textual culture of the Armenians. So, so the Armenians have the largest library in Jerusalem. This is a library of about um, 4,000 manuscripts. And, um, and it's a slightly um, different collection than what you would um, imagine because it was um, it accumulated into the city especially uh, when people who escaped the genocide came and brought it into the city. Some of the collection existed before and some of it um, grew and was brought into the library. So in the next um, um, photograph you would see um, this is the library. Now you can almost immediately see that um, it's not really a library, but a chapel. And um, in fact, a church, the Church of St. Taurus, was um, constructed in the Middle Ages for the first time. And it was converted into a library um, much later on. And, um, and it's closed. It's always closed. It's never open to the public. It's Which is why it took months of negotiation for us to be able to enter on this particular day. Um, and you'll notice also that there is no electricity in this in this library. If a scholar wants to use it, they have to sort of, first of all, get special permission from the patriarch, and second of all, have the librarian take in a long extension cord. <laughs> yes. Um, and um, it opens only on Centaurus Day. Centaurus Day is, you probably remember that now, um, <laughs> is on the third weekend of Lent. So there is no fixed date for it. You have to know when Lent is and the Orthodox tradition. And on the third weekend of Lent, it um, opens to, um, to people who come to pray. Um, that's the only opening day uh, of the year. Um, and this library has um, the main collection is the first 1,700 books um, were the first one to be catalogued. And the person who did this catalog arrange them by size. So it goes from the small <laughs> to the big. Um, didn't really expect the, <laughs> the library to grow, but um, everything that came later just was added one by one. And um, um, so, so, so that's how it grew. And about 180 of these books are not even there because they were deemed too precious to be inside the library. So when you have really precious books, you put them in the treasury. Now, the Armenian treasury, that was a picture that I just, <laughs> I dreamed of, of getting to one day make that photograph. Because in order to get into the treasury, it's not just that you need to get the permission of the patriarch, but you need the patriarch to come with a key. But with him, he needs to bring another person from the brotherhood of um, of, of the Armenian, uh, of, of St. James, to bring another key. And the third person has to be a lay person from the community who would come. And only when the three of them come together, they can open the treasury to let you in and um, check the manuscripts. Sort of like the nuclear codes of Jerusalem. <laughs> <laughs> and you'd ask yourself, is that all necessary? So they treat their books like treasure. and. There's a good reason for it, because it is a treasure, and it's worth a lot of money. Um, one example, which we have not yet been able to photograph, one day we'll be able to do that, is the Gospel of Queen Keran, um, which was drawn by an, um, a 13th century um, um, painter, um, Toros Roslin, the most famous of all Armenian um, decorators. We have five of his manuscripts in Jerusalem. Um, so the largest collection of his work. And in that particular one, he has the oldest um, portrait of the royal family, the Armenian royal family um, that he took. 
um, that, that he made in, in, in the book. But the cover of the book is made of gold, so, sorry, silver, and they decide to put it in the, in the treasury. Despite being in the treasury, sometime at the beginning of the 20th century, despite needing three keys to get in, someone managed to get in and cut off two pages um, from two of the two illustrations from that gospel and sell them. So they disappeared from Jerusalem. So first reason is clearly that it's wealth, it's temptation, and, and it happens. Um, thieves come to Jerusalem they, um, and get it. And you might ask yourself, who might it have been able to do that? In this particular case, it might not have been um, even strangers who, who walked into the, um, into the library. So, so that's quite painful. And all communities, there is not a single community that had not suffered um, such loss. I can also add that um, it's worth remembering there is not a single community, there is not a single archive or library that doesn't have secrets. So I remember it was a, a, the first line that I would say to, to the librarians, is, I'm, not, I'm not after secrets. I, w I want you to show me you know, the best and most wonderful things. I don't want to hear dirty secrets about, uh, about the library. Because the truth is, everyone has them. There is not such. There is no archive without secrets. The custodians of the written word in Jerusalem are not about democratization of knowledge, as they might be in the <laughs> West. They're about keeping people out. Uh, and we were often, I think, treated with suspicion. And uh, in many cases, it took months of negotiation to get some of these photographs. Before we leave the Armenians, um, I thought we would uh, show you what's probably the oldest illuminated codex in Jerusalem, um, <coughs> which could even go back to the 8th century, decorated, as you see, with these fantastical birds, a gospel on parchment in the St. Toros Armenian Library, um, which really points to one of the functions of, of libraries and archives in Jerusalem, which uh, is has to do with rivalries, not of territory, as we're accustomed to thinking about it, but rivalries as to which community has can prove their antiquity and continuity. If I can prove that I've been here longer than you, maybe I have more authentic claim than you do, right? So it's not just about the, um, uh, uh, I have this piece of property, I have East Jerusalem, you have West Jerusalem, it's also about how deep is my anchor. Before we move away from the, um from thieves and um, forgers <laughs> and, um, and the people who made um, Jerusalem a little bit paranoid, I'd like to introduce um, two, um, two characters. Um, so here you see portraits of probably the portrait of the most famous thief in Jerusalem, um, the colorful portrait of Bishop Uspensky um, Profurus Uspensky. The story goes that um, I was once sitting with um, one of the Greek Orthodox um, monks and a scholar and a very interesting figure who is also in charge of the choir of the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate, uh, Father Aristobulus. And I asked him exactly the question that we started with. What's the point of having a library if you don't let scholars in? And um, it's such an important thing. You really need to open it up. And you, as a scholar, know that. And he looked at me and he said one word. He said, Uspensky. And I looked at him and said, Uspensky? Yeah, I thought I knew the community quite well. And is that someone I, I'm supposed to know? <laughs> and and then quickly realized that we were to actually talking about someone who died ages ago. Um, Bishop Uspensky visited Jerusalem, was um, the first Russian, um, was sent by the Tsar to Jerusalem to find out what was going on with um, the Greek community and the Arab community and to assess the situation. Um, so it was a sort of a diplomatic mission as well as a religious mission. And he came, um, he came to the city, he traveled all over 
and went to visit um, the communities. He wrote f fascinating reports. Um, some of them are, were actually very valuable and changed a lot of what happened about the education in, in the area. And so there are many int good things to say about what he did. Um, he was also, he made it to St. Catherine and um, so um, the Sinaiticus, um, which he uh, declared um, heretical, possibly, because <laughs> he found some. Um, so he didn't appreciate, he didn't realize what he actually, the importance of what he saw over there. But he, um, the biggest story about him in Jerusalem, and the reason that the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate is so angry with him is as the patriarch would say, it's not so much that he stole one of our most precious manuscripts, the oldest dated manuscript that they had the, of the gospel from uh, the ninth century, but that the Russians are so proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's that how many, you know, we have manuscripts named after patrons of the books, we have manuscripts named after the authors, we have now, but there are, very few manuscripts in the world that are known after the thief who had stolen them. So um, gospel, the gospel, um, and Uspensky has two. There is one called um, Gospel Uspensky, and the other one uh, Porfiris, and um, Porfiri. And he wrote a little poem about himself, which I'd like to quote to you. He said. Why do I walk the earth so long to bring, like a bee, beautiful honey to my hive? I am God's bee, and Russia is my hive. <laughs> so <laughs> he was a proud collector. He, to some of the, he also paid for some of the stuff that he collected. But um, when he couldn't get it with money, then he found other ways. Um, it's a bit unfair what uh, we did here to put him next to um, another person who was not at all a thief, um, but um, Abraham Fyrkovich of the same period. Um, and I just love those two portraits so much. And, um, and a great manuscript collector. He became famous as a real, the, one of the, the key persons to identify um, Genizas around the world. He would go around Crimea um, and walk into synagogues, tapping on the walls, walk into, um, into cemeteries, finding Genizas over there. He collected a lot of manuscripts. And um, so yes, so um, Jewish tradition and Islamic tradition, um, you do not throw away books. Um, if there's the name of God written in them, uh, in the name of God is enough to keep the, um, the page sacred. So instead of throwing it away, you, the, the tradition, the custom is to bury it. Um, but until it's buried, you know, you, you get a big enough collection and then you take it all together and put it in, um, create a tomb for it. So um, the most famous Geniza that people have, might have heard of is the Cairo Geniza. Um, where inside, inside the, um, the synagogue itself, there was a, an additional room and a hole through the, um, uh, the wall, and you just throw away all the books that fell apart and that you didn't need. Um, and over there, Schechter, who came from uh, Cambridge, found this unbelievable um, amount of, um, of manuscripts, including handwriting, um, letters by Maimonides um, and all sorts of other things. Firkovich found it before Schechter. Um, he was not terribly interested in it because he also found a Karaite um, Geniza in Cairo, which he was more interested in um, being a Karaite. And, um, and so he left Schechter <laughs> to, to work on the, on, the, uh, the, on the Geniza and he took um, the other one. He came to Jerusalem and he collected and bought a lot of manuscripts. Um, By the way, the Germans have a term for the dust left on your clothing after you've gone Geniza diving for manuscripts in these repositories, and that term is Geniza schmutz. 
Um, um, Filkovich wrote about um, his collection. He wrote, um, and I removed from Jerusalem without regard to the great anathema, as I um, relied on the, on the verse, for out of Zion shall go forth the law. For the sake of heaven, I removed them from the darkness of the storeroom in order to enlighten the land and benefit the many. So perhaps an answer to what we were saying earlier, a reason to, to work against those closed libraries is actually to bring them out to light. He really believed, they both believed that they were doing something that was necessary. Um, they shared, um, uh, Uspensky in particular thought that you know, some of the manuscripts he found were kept in the hands of people who were not worthy of them. So he wanted to save them. And um, at least in the case of Firkovich, that's absolutely the case. Um, all the manuscripts that he saved from Jerusalem, um, where that's the only thing that saved, where, where uh, that actually lasted from the Jewish community in Jerusalem, because everything else, all the, li all the libraries, the yeshivas, the synagogues, were destroyed in 1948. Except one, we'll come to it in the end. So just to uh, sort of give a taste of the uh, behind the scenes making of this book, um, a 19th century theft was invoked in keeping us out in the year 2015, right? As if it were yesterday. The word Uspensky was barred our way. But because of our persistence, not for long. Uh, and at some times, we actually took advantage of the rivalries between communities. For example, the moment we got permission finally to uh, enter into the Armenian library, of course, we told the Greeks that we had had that permission. And wouldn't it be a shame if you weren't also included, if your manuscript library, which is, of course, even more glorious than the Armenians, and perhaps even more uh, uh, ant antique, would also not be included? Uh, <coughs> Yeah. Very different to the two characters we just saw. They, they shared another thing they had in common was not just their passion for the manuscript, but also their great arrogance. Um, and very much unlike them is the next person we are meeting here, Abuna Shimon Khan, uh, one of the dearest and most, um, most amazing people we met in, in Jerusalem. And here we learned a, an entirely different reason for not letting people into the library. Um, the Syriac Library of St. Mark, I heard about it for so many years and I was told, you know, this is the one place you'll never be able to go in because um, they don't let anyone into it. And when I approached Abuna Shimon the first time um, to talk about, you know, how can we um, preserve you your, your manuscript library, do you need help? I asked him. And he looked at me. I, I, I don't think anyone ever asked him if they need help before. And he said, yes. Um, and then he said, you know, we have this problem with the books. And he said, I don't know the word in English for it. In, in Syriac, it's called tala'at. And I said, you, d you don't mean woodworms, do you? I, I, would, I don't know Syriac, but... Um, uh, in Hebrew, it's exactly the same word. And yeah. I was like, you don't mean you, you have woodworms? He said, yes, that's exactly what we have in the library. And it, worked, it turned out that he was, he was just embarrassed. He was ashamed of the state of the library. And it was the first time that I realized that that's one of the major reasons for, for people not to let us into the libraries. What, what a big moment it was to realize that there is no big secret, it's just shame. And if that is the case, it is even more tragic. We need to be able to, to help um, this way. So the Syriac community is a community within the Christian quarter of the old city. It's a compound within a compound within a compound. And uh, we visited Abu Nashimon several times. He told us his life story, how he was born in Turabdin in southeastern Turkey, the home, the heartland of, of Syriac culture, 
Uh, he, he's been in Jerusalem since 1980. He told us, um, one time we went to visit him with two curators from the Met Museum in New York who were putting on several years ago an exhibition about Jerusalem, and he was so embarrassed by the state of the library, he refused even then to let us into the library of 400 manuscripts. When we finally did go in, you know, the hinges were falling off of the bookcases. Um, and then he also mentioned that there are some texts that he venerates to such a degree that he kneels when he reads them. And so we captured him, we decided to capture him in the book in that pose with a 15th century manuscript, one of his favorite, one of his favorite manuscripts. Yeah, a homily on um, humility and love. <coughs> and this is so him, he, these the stories he tells are so moving. Um, Ab Abuna Shimon Khan is not the only person who has this quiet um, and more um, humble, presence in the city. Well, we, you know, sometimes um, Jerusalem is such a small place and, um, and you get those encounters between, y you just move from one street and you take a little turn and you find yourself in a, an entirely different place. So the Armenians to the Syrians is a few minutes walk. Um, but right next to him, on another occasion, we went to visit um, one of the rabbis of Jerusalem, um, Daniel Sperber. Um, we heard about his library, and we <laughs> heard that, um, you know, it's just, we, we, we didn't include many private, really personal libraries um, in, in the book. Um, and actually, and Daniel Sperber, we wanted to write about it. Somehow, um, he was left out. But um, this is something we would like, would love to one day do, because it turned out that Daniel Sperber, who happens to be one of the, the greatest scholars of Syriac and Aramaic, who um, took us into his library and opened those uh, wooden uh, drawers um, with just card, cards of, um, full of encyclopedic um, um, little words, you know, uh, tracing words from Aramaic, from Greek, from Latin into, all, what, what was it? Um, Greek words in, in the Talmud. Um, so he listed, he published um, a book about that, um, but also about um, Syriac and Aramaic. And he walked us into his library. We climbed to the roof of his house, and we suddenly realized that we were literally next door to Abu Nashimon. Like, well, it was, <laughs> the, the, the city is so complex, and you walked around and around in like little narrow alleyways, and. But it turned out we were actually physically at the same space um, where those two amazing libraries, um, both on, uh, with amazing Syriac text right next to each other. Um, so we thought that was a good combination to bring them together. And this is the interior of <coughs> Sperber's library. And I think we have this dream of these two men who both live and breathe Aramaic in their own ways um, to, to bring them together one day. These two men who, are, who have been neighbors for decades who have never met. Yeah. One of the poorest communities of Jerusalem, and you probably realize by now that we are actually focusing, first of all, on the old city and perhaps on the smaller communities and um, rather than the big national communities. Um, is the Ethiopian community. There are many ways of saying no, um, as we have learned over the years, um, but <laughs> there's none of them is as irritating as so when someone tells you, yes, of course you're welcome to my library. You say, oh, fantastic, and say, but tomorrow. And I think it was for two long months I was very pregnant. It was very hot in Jerusalem. And, and then I decided we're not giving up this time. We kept coming every day. So we'll try tomorrow, we'll try tomorrow. And you'd come the next day, and the person with the key is not there today. Uh, no, he had to go to Tel Aviv. And on and on and on it went from one day to another. Until finally, they admitted that they were not allowed to allow us into the library. We had to request a meeting with the Archbishop. Archbishop then told us, you actually need to get a permission. I'm not allowed to give you a permission to get into the library. 
you need to get it from the patriarch in Addis Ababa. And I think that was definitely our, the longest trip <laughs> we made in order to get permission um, <laughs> to enter a library, flying in and out to Addis Ababa, meet the patriarch, ask for permission. Um, <laughs> and you know what, the patriarch, he looked at me, he was very happy um, to see me because he was the archbishop in Jerusalem many years ago. And he looked at me and he said quietly to his secretary, what's wrong with Jerusalem? <laughs> um, but, um, and that was it. It was, you know, I, I said, wait, the, the synod will, um, will issue you a, a permission. And I remember I said to him, um, can you please just write it down because <laughs> I cannot come back home and say that I don't have a permission. I need to have it in writing. So he signed it and gave it to me. And then Ben and I went to the archbishop and showed him, yes, we have a permission. The archbishop said, that's fine. But now the synod needs to meet. <laughs> you know, it will take a few more months before you'd be able to enter. This is an example of a text that was brought as many of the texts in the Ethiopian community were on the backs of uh, monks and pilgrims who uh, brought these texts by foot from Ethiopia to Jerusalem. Uh, quite an amazing, quite an amazing, I don't know if any of you have seen the movie Exodus with Paul Newman, um, but there's a famous chase scene that happens exactly here next to the Ethiopian uh, library, which is next to the circular Ethiopian Church of Jerusalem. It's a fantastic place, but the fact that it's circular is very relevant to how Paul Newman <coughs> gets away from uh, British arrest. We're moving on away from the Christian community for a bit. Um, this is Hader Salame, a former sheikh, um, director of the El Aqsa um, Mosque Library and currently the uh, librarian of the Khalidi Library in Jerusalem. Um, and he, here we, we ask ourselves another question. This is another thing we wanted to understand. You see what happened to us. We, we were at the beginning so angry with the people who didn't allow us into their libraries. And after, it, was not, it didn't take very long, but we ended up actually falling in love with them and realizing that the store, our book, is actually about them. It's, it's also about the libraries, but it's ultimately about the people, the guardians of those places. And Hader is a particular case of someone who had a terrible story. He was um, born um, just before 48. Uh, family lived through the Nakba. They were kicked out of their home. He grew up in a refugee camp. Um, and um, and, and we wanted to understand how someone who grows up in a refugee camp decides to become a librarian. So we asked him to take us through the whole journey. We went with him to the place where he was born. Um, we went to visit the archaeological sites of Tel Azika. Um, and he has a great passion. What, he's also a scholar. Um, and um, one of the things that he's famous for is piecing um, stone inscriptions together. Uh, and it's, that's why we, Frederick chose to take um, this photograph of him in, surrounded by all those um, stone inscriptions from the um, El Aqsa Mosque. And Hada Salama became very, um, he can be very cynical sometimes about you know, how difficult it is convince people of the importance of the libraries, the collections, the inscriptions. Um, when you know, the new generation comes in and say, we need new marble in the mosque, and they decide to just cover all the inscriptions with some, um, something new, a plastic and neon lights instead of, of, the, of the old, um, of the old um, books and archaeological artifacts. Um, but we learned a lot from him, and he really opened the door to understanding, um, to understanding the city and allow us into those amazing treasures. Um, just a few of the treasures that he showed us. 
Just that um, there are several libraries on the Temple Mount Haram al-Sharif that we were able to visit with the special permission of the Waqf. This is a whole other process of negotiation. We met with the head of the Waqf, which is the Islamic Endowment, uh, which, which answers not to any Israeli authorities, but to Jordan, ultimately to King Hussein. And Sheikh Azam was able to give us permission to visit several sites. One is a library underneath Al-Aqsa Mosque in the old Herodian part of the Second Temple era part of that, of that mosque. Um, a second is steps away from the Dome of the Rock is a UNESCO funded library of uh, manus manuscript restoration where, they're, where they restore medieval uh, manuscripts on light tables imported from Italy, including a manuscript of the, on the day that we visited by none other than Al Ghazali, who himself lived in Jerusalem for 10 years and wrote one of his works there. And we got to see that being restored in real time at this um, uh, UNESCO uh, restoration library. And then the third is the one that we're seeing now, which is in the Al-Aqsa Museum, which has basically been closed since 2001, but due to Mirab's persuasive powers, we were able to visit. So what you see here um, is, a, uh, is a rubber box that um, contains um, just a copy of the Quran, but it's not just any copy of the Quran. It was written in the handwriting of the Sultan of the Maghreb um, in the 14th century. He did himself three copies of the entire Quran, um, sent one to Mecca, one to Medina, and one to Jerusalem. Only this one in Jerusalem survived. And um, it's such a great, great treasure. Um, here you can this see is the interior. Here you can see one of the um, examples. And he asked, when he finished doing it, he asked um, um, other scholars to proof it and correct um, and add all the, um, uh, um, the punctuations and, um, and make sure he didn't make any, any mistakes. Um, what a rare and wonderful, um, wonderful manuscript. Um, was recently asked back by the uh, Moroccans they requested it and had to be turned down. This is why it's so many volumes. If you can only write five lines a page. <laughs> <laughs> um, another beautiful manuscript, just not to, not, um, we're getting to be worried about our time, but um, you can see here um, a, a manuscript that was sent um, from um, Andalusia, um, was written by, um, so from Spain, and it was, um, there are, he has all those um, amazing writing. You can actually read it in various ways. You can read it, you start from here and you can read to the right or to the left and you climb up and it, it rhymes wh whichever way you go. Um, and this is, um, this is a manuscript that was dedicated um, to Saladin and um, as, as a hero of, um, of Islam. Um, and is at the uh, Khalidi Library today. Um, <clears throat> it turns out that Jerusalem, you don't stop imagining Jerusalem once you're in Jerusalem. And you don't stop longing for Jerusalem even when you're in Jerusalem itself. And we thought, what else could explain the paradoxical abundance of copies of Jerusalem and models of Jerusalem in Jerusalem itself and many of the archives that we visited. Um, this is one that I think reflects the duality of Jerusalem, which was um, a wooden model built by Conrad Schick in the 19th century, um, who is a German-born missionary and architect and, and archaeologist. Uh, who wasn't just renowned for his craftsmanship, but he was also one of the very few people who was allowed into the cisterns underneath the Temple Mount and did very, very precise uh, measurements. And many of these pieces on his model you can actually lift up and, and see. Now, what's... Um, or change them. So you can actually... Um, this is really part of the imagination that you can remove the mosque and put this first temple on top, or the second temple, or play with all the parts um, like like a little um, jigsaw puzzle. And uh, this is sort of a segue into our next section because um, very few people who live in the ultra orthodox section of Jerusalem today, which is called Mea Sharim, um, know that that the urban design of that neighborhood was designed by none other than 
the Lutheran missionary Conrad Schick. He himself built his own house around the corner of the Ethiopian uh, church compound, which we'll talk about later. But before we do, one of the places in Me'asharim that Merav and I got to visit was uh, called Kolel Galicia. Maybe you can take us there. So, you know, it's quite rare that people um, uh, call themselves after a place you know, um, that doesn't exist anymore. Um, when we walked into Kolel Galicia, I was struck by a few things, um, but mostly by a big map on the wall. And having known quite a few ultra-Orthodox places, it was the first time I saw a, a map on the wall in, in a Kolel. Um, and I asked the archivist, um, why do you have this map on the wall? And he said, well, it's because um, it's because we we are obliged to we are a charity and our charity is dedicated to everyone who comes from Galicia, but we don't really know where Galicia is and we have to trace it down to the dots on this map. So if someone who comes to us and says that he is from Galicia, we look up at where the village that they came from and we check that it's actually from the area that um, is included in our mandate of support. Now, this is just a real introduction, a very simple introduction to the entire big world of, um, of the ultra-Orthodox community. And I have to make a little confession here. I left for a long time. Uh, we presumed, we, we just presumed that it would be very hard to get into Masharim and to visit the archives there. Um, and therefore, we just delayed it. And, but once we did, um, you know, dressed up nicely um, and knocked on the door, we found the most welcoming world. And it was, um, it was very humbling and very important um, to realize that it was just really simply uh, our own mistake of not doing it um, earlier. But um, the problem we encounter there is that um, there's very little historical consciousness. So these are the communities that are dedicated, truly dedicated to charity work, but um, are not as obsessed as other people would be with writing their own histories. So the archives are not important for their own sake. They are important for other reasons, mainly as a database, a big database for to know who you could, you know, you could apply to get support from for donations. Um, one one of the communities explains that um, they, you know, they made a promise a hundred years ago to someone who gave them money that they would pray on the day the your site, the day of their death, and they are committed to it. So we, they have to digitize it and to keep to keep their promise. Um, so that would be a reason for them to keep the archive, just so they know what they have, they have to do. Um, but they, what they do have, and after explaining earlier that everything in Jerusalem, in the old city, um, vanished um, in, in 48, so the communities that left the old city before 48, like the Galicia community that moved out of the old city, um, at the turn of the uh, 20th century, they took their, their material with them. So we, in, uh, their archives are really important. And they are very much overlooked because, um, because uh, they tend to be um, non-Zionist, and therefore they don't co cooperate with the National Library or with any of the national institutions to, to do things um, together and make sure that their archives are, are Palestinian anti-Zionism is nothing compared to these guys. <laughs> I'll just say that these um, images are not altered in any way. These are the multi-exposure glass negatives as we found them uh, in this community. And uh, this is the archivist that, we, that hosted us, Rabbi Fruchthandler. Um, and we had this idea that we were going to help them by putting Fruchthandler in touch with the eminent uh, expert on 19th century glass negatives in Jerusalem, whose name is Father Jean-Michel de Tarragon, who happens to be 
a Dominican father at the Ecole Biblique in Jerusalem, which brings us to another very brief story, which is that Mirav and I are visiting the Ecole Biblique library, uh, which, as I say, begins in the 19th century. This is the heart of Dominican Jerusalem, outside of the old city. And of course, Fruchtender in the end refuses this cooperation. But in the meantime, we got to see this library. And the librarian, who's a Polish monk, takes us down to the basement of the library, uh, which specializes in um, uh, Semitic grammars and lexical books and dictionaries. And he says, I want to show you one of our treasures. It's a shelf that the founder of modern Hebrew in the 19th century, his name was Eliezer ben Yehuda, he used to come from his, his house on Ethiopia Street. He lived across from the Ethiopian monastery. Everything comes together in the end. And he walked downhill to the Ecole Biblique, and he consulted our dictionaries as he was recreating and resurrecting the language, as he was creating the first modern Hebrew dictionary. We were the only place that had these grammars and dictionaries, and we still preserve the shelf that he consulted. And sure enough, there's the Eliezer ben Yehuda shelf in the Ecole Biblique. And the librarian says to us, we like to say here in the Dominican community that modern Hebrew was resurrected here among the Dominicans. <laughs> Eliezer ben Yehuda was a great friend of the founder of the Dominican community, Father Lagrange. Last, uh, last thing we want to really talk to is in yet another instance of uh, sort of surprising um, acts that transcend the usual boundaries of Jerusalem and that involve preserving the memories not just of one's own community, but preserving the memories uh, of others. Just like in the Eliezer ben Yehuda Dominican case, here's another divide that we discovered for the first time in our researches for the book. Yes. So. I told you a few times that the, the libraries of the Jewish libraries in the old city um, were destroyed, except one. Um, and this is, this is just um, a story of this woman and her family. Um, the Vinograd um, family had a yeshiva called Yeshiva um, Etzchain in the old city. And, um, and that yeshiva had um, been through a lot of trouble during the riots in the, um, at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, in the 30s, they, it was basically evacuated. Um, but um, but it, was, it remained there, and it had, it, it had its library there. Um, and in 1948, when everything else was looted and destroyed, the Basha family took over this place and concealed the library. Behind a false wall. They build up a false wall and they close this place. In 1967, um, Ishayao Vinograd, who is a... Isra Israeli Jews were not allowed into the old city at all between 48 and 67. So the Vinograd family did not know the fate of their library. And when bibliophile and a, a great man on his own um, account decided to go and see, the first thing he did in 67 was to go back to see what happened to um, the yeshiva. And he knocked on the door and was let in and they opened um, the, the, um, the, only, the only library that, um, that survived. Um, it is also a tragic story because today there is, um, she lives, she, the family continues to live right next to that yeshiva. The yeshiva was now given, handed over to a group of settlers who don't know this story and don't care about it um, and make her, her life very miserable. And we went to talk to her and asked well, her. Well, Merav and I interviewed Vinograd, told us the story. We said, what's the name of the Palestinian family that saved your library? And he said he couldn't recall. He hadn't been in touch since the Six Day War in the 67. So we, we do what we always do, and, and, and this is our method of research in Jerusalem. We knock on doors, cold calls. We go to that place in the corner. We start asking shopkeepers, one of whom um, says that's, that's just an urban legend. Finally, we found someone who says, no, I know the family, took us there. We knocked on Dina's door, and five minutes later, we're sitting in her living room, and she says, yes, that was my late father who did this. And she takes out a portrait of him and puts it next to her on the couch. That's, that's him next to her. Um, and so just like we have this dream of 
uh, introducing um, Abuna Shimon to the Talmudic scholar Sperber, we have a dream one day also of bringing Vinograd together with Dina Albasha, the daughter of the man who saved the Vinograd Yeshiva Library. I remember how moved you were when you asked us, and why did you do that? You know, why did you save the books when everyone else didn't? And he said, it was the right thing to do. Um, it was just so simple and so normal. Um, we want to leave some time for questions, so um, maybe we'll just conclude on this note. After a couple of years of negotiation, we were finally let and end, you know, sort of uh, <coughs> extortion on our part uh, and playing on the rivalries. We were finally allowed into the heart of the Greek Orthodox uh, community uh, of Jerusalem, and that is their manuscript library, uh, which is almost never visited, I think it's fair to say. Right, right Merav? Um, it was closed for a long time for renovations, and um, so that was the official line. Um, some scholars who had good contact were able to get a single book here and there, but, um, but they're really sensitive um, and um, really prefer not to let anyone in. They also, they sometimes would digitize something for you if you ask for a specific page, but it's not easy at all. Um, However, um, yeah, it was, it was, we were allowed in, and I, I think that this is one of our, the most wonderful and intimate photographs. Um, this is um, uh, Theophilus um, the third um, patriarch of Jerusalem, and um, Father Aristarchos, who is a, 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 a real scholar and a lover of books and a keeper of them. He was, he's really, you know, when, when I told him that we wanted to do this book, he said, but we're not, we don't want to encourage tourism. You know, our library is not for tourists. That's not what it's about. Um, if it, if serious, serious scholars know about our library, and they can always write to us. Um, that was one of his, of his lines. But one day, you know, I asked for specifically to see some of their treasures, and we, we'll finish with the last image of one of their amazing treasures. Um, and I asked to see just a couple of their beautiful manuscripts. And we had the permission to come and take photographs. And the evening before, he calls and said, would you mind if we have the meeting not in the Patriarchate, just with those books, but let's do it in the library. And so then we finally had the permission to come in, um, to bring the camera to, for Frederick to come in and also take this um, exceptional photograph. I didn't tell you, but I, I uh, took a page when you weren't looking. <laughs> um, two, two of the most famous um, and well-known manuscripts that the Greek Orthodox um, Library has are palimpsests. Maybe we'll just conclude by saying that um, we finally, after years of working on this book, realized retroactively what we had been doing. And that is that we had read Jerusalem itself as a kind of a palimpsest in which text has been written over text, in which the, um, the upper text doesn't eradicate the lower text, doesn't eradicate or overwrite memory such as, as much as it really preserves, even unwittingly, the earlier, the earlier memories, the earlier texts. And so we, we started to realize that we've, what we've been doing actually all along is to look at Jerusalem as a series of, of texts, sometimes in very different languages, that have been reaching for each other across the centuries, somehow speaking to each other, somehow preserving each other, even when they weren't intending to. These are the concluding notes, but um, I'll just tell you what you're actually looking at. Um, and um, this is, what you see here is um, a palimpsest, which means that um, this is uh, a parchment which was erased and a new text written over it. But with the use of the simplest technology of uh, infrared, nowadays you can actually take a photograph and find the older text. And in this particular one, um, you, you can see that um, there is um, a lost play by Euripides that um, was discovered below, um, below the text. Four centuries separate the upper and lower texts in this case. 
So I think with that, we will uh, conclude our little tour of <laughs> <coughs> Jerusalem's archives, and we would welcome any uh, comments and, and questions. Thank you.